Welcome everyone. I'm Lisa Moon and I'm president and CEO of the Global Food Banking Network. Thank you for joining us today for this special event, Fighting Food Waste to Improve Food Security, Solutions for People and the Planet. The Global Food Banking Network is honored to convene this event with RAP and the Harvard Law School Food Law and Policy Clinic. And we thought it was particularly important to hold today's conversation alongside the United Nations High Level Political Forum, because the two sustainable development goals that underpin our work are up for review this year. These are SDG 2, Zero Hunger, and SDG 12, Responsible Consumption and Production, especially target 12.3, which is having global per capita food loss and waste. It will come as no surprise to anyone attending today's event to hear that we are not on track to achieve these SDGs by 2030. Earlier this week, when the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization released the new State of Food Security and Nutrition Report, and this report is the first to begin to capture the impact that the pandemic has had on the global community's ability to access adequate and quality nutrition. It stated that about 118 million more people faced chronic hunger in 2020 than in 2019, and about 2.37 billion people, which comes out to almost one in three people worldwide, faced food insecurity. This represents an increase of almost 320 million people in one year which is roughly equal to the total increase of the last five years combined. And finally, the report estimated that approximately 3 billion people are unable to afford a healthy diet. This reality, of course, occurs in a food system where nearly a third of all food produced for hum human consumption is lost or wasted. And today we have an opportunity mm -hmm. with a range of experts and thought leaders to explore this nexus in more detail. Before I bring in our first speaker, I need to cover some quick housekeeping. First, please make sure you select your language preference using the interpretation button at the bottom of the screen and select English or Spanish. After our opening speaker, we will have a moderated panel discussion and we will take questions from the audience following the panel. So I encourage you to please submit your questions using the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen at any time. And we will do our best to get as many as possible. This session is being recorded and is considered on the record. A video recording of this session will be available following today. So to kick off our panel, I would like to introduce Clementine O'Connor, who is the Food Waste Focal Point at the United Nations Environmental Program. UNEP is custodian of the SDG 12.3 Food Waste Indicator, the Food Waste Index, which tracks country level progress towards having food waste by 2030. Clementine co-authored the 2021 Food Waste Index Report, developing the new global food waste estimates and a common methodology for countries to measure and report on this important topic. Welcome Clementine. We look forward to your remarks as we frame today's conversation. Thank you so much for the chance to be here. I'm going to share a few quick slides with you. Um, I'll be right with you. Hope you can see these okay. Thank you. There we go. Great. Great to be here today. Um, I'm going to be talking about the UNEP Food Waste Index, um, uh, but I'm going to start briefly with uh, what is food loss and waste. The UN uh, understands food loss to occur from the farm up to and excluding the retail sector and food waste to occur at retail food service and household level uh, regardless of cause. Um, food loss and waste is a problem of an epic scale. Uh, a third of all food uh, produced is thought to go to waste, costing us almost a trillion each year, uh, um, uh, generating 8% of global greenhouse gas emissions and using land and water uh, resources that could have been used to grow more food at the same time are uh, impacting uh, biodiversity. Uh, food loss and waste uh, reduction tackles hunger as well as, as well as a range of targets across the 2030 uh, agenda. 690 million 
people were affected by hunger in 2019. Uh, and this is, of course, expected to rise with the pandemic with the pandemic while three billion people are unable to afford a healthy diet. Um, food loss and waste uh, impacts targets on land, water, cities and sustainable consumption and production as well as of course climate and these co-benefits make food waste prevention a primary area for inclusion in COVID-19 recovery strategy. Um, UNEP's uh, emissions gap report shows us that we are heading for three degrees of global warming by the end of the century. If we don't change course, this would be a catastrophe. But so far, food loss and waste has been largely ignored in in a country's climate strategies. Uh, UNEP, together with partners, published uh, guidance on including food loss and waste and sustainable food consumption more broadly uh, in a publication enhancing NDCs for food systems, which can be of help here. Um, to tackle target 12.3, um, uh, a clear framework has been provided. We have the food loss the index, which tracks food loss up to and excluding the retail sector, and the food waste index, of which UNEP is the custodian that I'm going to talk about today. Um, we published the food waste index report um, in March of this year, together with partner RAP. It finds that 17% of all food that survey available to consume goes to waste, which is almost a billion tons uh, at household retail and food service factor. It finds that food waste is a global problem that is not confined only to rich countries, but that household per capita food waste is highly compact compa comparable regardless of country income group. Um, as you can see here, uh, indeed the average household food waste per person per year is 74 kilos, which is greater than the weight of the average person. Um, the report identified 152 uh, data points in 54 countries. So it's the most detailed uh, piece of uh, data collect action that has been attempted to date. And yet it finds only a handful of countries have good food waste data in all three of these uh, factors. So much more needs to be done to quantify this so that countries can plan how to use that food in a more efficient way so that it can feed people and it can reduce climate change. Um, to tackle this problem, UNEP is launching regional food waste working groups in the regions that you can see here. We have room from, uh, for a few more countries to join. It primer, it primarily targets uh, ministries of environment so that they can measure their food waste baseline, uh, develop a food waste prevention strategy for their country and track their progress to 2030. Um, to conclude, uh, UNEP is part of a fantastic team uh, within the 
UN Food Systems Summit uh, to take action on food loss and waste around the world and uh, to work with countries to help them identify the most appropriate uh, approaches and solutions so that food loss and waste can be tackled across the supply chain. Thanks so much for your uh, attention and please find the link to the food waste uh, index report here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Clementine, and congratulations to UNEP for that report, which came out earlier this year. I know it was a very difficult data set to collect, and the analysis um, is absolutely vital um, to informing the work that we do moving forward. So thank you so much. I would now like to introduce Dana Gunders, who is the Executive Director of ReFed, a US-based nonprofit um, working to end food loss and waste across the food system in the States by advancing data-driven uh, solutions. She's considered a national expert on food systems and was one of the first people to raise the alarm about how much food is wasted across the United States and the subsequent impacts on the environment, economy, and food security. Dana, thank you for moderating today and welcome. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. Um, I really appreciate everyone taking the time to learn more about this issue and what we can all be doing about it. Um, and thank you to Clementine for her work. Uh, it's been such a big lift for UNEP to, to bring that work together. So um, excited to see that and, and all the new information we'll get from that report. Um, as Lisa described, I'm the executive director of ReFed, which is a US-based organization that's entirely focused on ending food loss and waste within the US. Um, food loss and waste is a challenge in the US, just like it is around the world. A recent analysis that we did found that about 35% of all the food in the US is unsold or uneaten. Um, some of that gets donated, but only about 3% of all that unsold uneaten food is actually being donated. The rest is either being recycled or going to waste destinations. Um, and of course, it's a huge waste of resources and, and, and potential nutrition for people. Um, you know, one other aspect of this is that we are looking forward at a world in 2050 where estimates are showing we will need about 50% more food then than we have today to feed that population. Um, and so where will that food come from? Will it come from food we're already using? Um, and, I'm sorry, already growing? Or will we um, need to convert more land to produce that food? We have a real opportunity here to use our food better. And this is made even worse by a recent, um, or rather even more urgent, I should say, by a recent analysis by Stanford University that found that agricultural productivity is declining, has declined about 21% in the last 60 years, um, which just increases the urgency to use the food that we are growing to actually feed people and make sure all of it's going to its best use. Um, I think the good news is that this is a solvable problem and people around the world are, are interested, people instinctively know that wasting food is not a good thing. So really what we need to do is give them solutions and give them that sense of urgency that this is something they need to pay attention to. And that's why I'm so excited about this panel. Uh, we have five experts from all around the world and from different sectors who are going to talk about different types of solutions to food waste. First, we'll be speaking with Emily Broadleib, uh, she is a clinical professor of law and the founding director of the Harvard Law School Food Law and Policy Clinic, um, as well as the deputy director of the Harvard Law School Center for Health Law and Policy Innovation. After that, we have Dr. Sengmak So. He's the president, uh, global president of the International Council on Social Welfare, as well as the president of the Korea National Council on Social Welfare. We have Ayla Ziz, who's the Senior Vice President of Global Sales at Food Business Danone. 
Um, then Richard Swannell, who is an environmental scientist and the director of the Waste and Resources Action Program, or RAP, in the UK. Um, and last, we have Elijah Amu Addo. He's the executive director of Food for All Africa, which is West Africa's first and largest food bank. Thank you all for joining us today. Uh, let's get right to the questions. So Emily, beginning with you, when we think of reasons for why food can go to waste, one reason that isn't often considered are the national policies and legislations. And sometimes these can be huge obstacles and barriers and actually cause food to go into waste. And other times they can really help us in our efforts to reduce that loss. Um, so as all of these member states are gathering, uh, what do you think they should be focusing on in terms of the policies that can either hinder or enable progress on this issue? All right, thank you so much, Dana. Um, and thanks for the great presentation by Clementine. I'm really glad to be here and grateful to the Global Food Banking Network and RAP for uh, partnering with us and, and including us in this, in this important dialogue. Um, so the Food Law and Policy Clinic that I direct at Harvard Law School is an action-based educational program uh, where we work with law students that are learning about and working on food law and policy projects on a range of food system issues. And we've worked for years on food waste and food recovery issues here in the U.S. And over the past few years, we've been working with the Global Food Banking Network and with support from Walmart Foundation on a project that really identifies the policies that governments can adopt that limit food waste and can feed hungry people by in, in encouraging more food donation. So Dana sort of alluded to this a little bit in the question, but a lot of times people ask why look at law and policy and um, government policies make a, play a huge role in whether food is wasted or donated. Sometimes there's confusion over the laws and their application to food donation, which is the case often in terms of national food safety laws that, that may not even mention food donation and may not make it clear that food can be donated. Sometimes there's barriers to donation that are embedded in laws, such as requirements that are really costly to meet. Um, like for example, having tax be due on food that is donated even though no one's making any money on that food. And sometimes there's just a lack of incentives for food to be donated. Um, so what we did over the past few years is we uh, launched the Global Food Donation Policy Atlas, which you can find at atlas.foodbanking.org. And I'll show a picture in just a moment. And uh, here we go. And this, uh, the attempt here is to really share research on food donation laws and policies across countries that can promote or hinder food donation. So you can see here an uh, image from the website. Um, what we've done is over the first two years, we did a deep dive on the laws and policies in 14 different countries. And we're now doing research in eight additional countries. Um, we've worked really closely with the GFN members and affiliates in each country to do, to understand the landscape there and to really map the current laws and figure out how they're working or not, and then come up with recommendations. And this site that you can see here is where we're sharing all of that information. So the Atlas, um, it allows users to pick a policy topic from the left-hand side of the screen. And when you click on any of those, you'll see countries turn different colors based on whether they have no policy in that area, uh, a strong policy, which is in green, or a weak policy, which is in yellow. And then you can also find out more about why that policy is considered in those different categories. Um, so thank you so much uh, for sharing that the image. Um, and I'll share the link in the chat later. So what did we find? We found that in virtually all of the countries we researched, there were actually really active dialogues underway about how to think about and reform government policies on food donation. However, countries were often making these decisions in a vacuum. Um, so one issue is that food loss and waste is a topic that can span multiple government agencies or ministries. So there's not really a natural forum for sharing policy best practices across countries. Um, but this is really a shame because countries can learn so much from one another and can really accelerate progress by seeing policies that are strong from other countries and picking and choosing what might work well for them. Um, the other really interesting finding for us was that despite the really different legal context and the really 
quite different food bank models in use in different countries, the same key kind of policy and legal issues emerged in virtually every country. So the seven main issues that we analyzed were food safety laws and whether and how they contributed to the ability to donate safe and wholesome food, date labeling, liability protection for food donors and food recovery organizations, tax incentives for donation, tax barriers to donation, donation requirements or waste penalties, and lastly, government grants and incentives. So I'm gonna give two really quick examples that I think show just what we saw across countries. One was on food date labeling policies. Um, unclear date labels lead to millions of tons of food waste across the globe. Um, and in most cases, food date labels really indicate freshness, not safety. Um, and that's true for most foods. For most foods, it's really impossible to even put a label that would indicate safety. Um, it's really about taste and quality and freshness. Uh, and there was a ton of divergence of, across countries on this. Most of the countries we studied had some policy in place, but it was generally pretty weak. Um, the U.S. was an outlier. There's no policy. There's no federal law on date labels in the U.S. Um, and we've done a lot of work here, and I can kind of answer questions about that at a later time. Um, and well, in most countries, the reason we qualified those policies as weak was that they either didn't standard, they, they had a standard label, but they weren't clear whether that label was around safety or quality, or the label, um, even if one was indicating quality, uh, donation of food or sale of food wasn't permitted after that date, um, even though it was meant to be about freshness. Um, the best practice was in the UK, uh, which has a mandatory policy that standardizes labels to um, use by and best before to um, clarify whether it's for safety or quality. And I attribute a lot of the success there to the work of RAC, so we'll hear about that later. Um, and I see that Dana has come back on, so I was gonna also mention liability protection, but happy to do that later if there are questions about that. I think that's another area where um, whether there's protection or not for food donors and food banks um, can really be a barrier to donation. And it's an, an active dialogue in a lot of the countries that we've been looking at. So thank you again, and I look forward to the conversation. Thank you so much, Emily. And I encourage everyone to go um, investigate that, re that resource further. It's got a ton of in information that's incredible. Um, Sengmak, we will move to you now. Uh, moving kind of from that global perspective to the more national one, South Korea has been a real leader in government intervention and reducing food waste through that. So tell us a little bit about what policies or partnerships have, have been most successful in South Korea. Uh, I'd like to uh, cite three examples uh, today. But the third one is, uh, which is food bank, I will talk about in the, in the second round. So this time I will mention two things. Uh, the first thing uh, is the introduction of the volume-based food waste fee system. Uh, this system was first introduced uh, in 2010 after trial uh, period of two years. And I understand that uh, Korea is the first country to introduce this uh, food waste management system nationwide. Uh, the so-called RFID, which means radio frequency identification, uh, this uh, RFID-based food waste management system uh, is designed to charge fees for the amount of food waste thrown away. And it works like this. If the resident tags the uh, RFID chip on the food waste bin in apartment complexes, data on his or her and also the uh, food waste weight and time are sent to the uh, central system whereby fees are charged to each household. Uh, this system is spread to more than 50% of the all the apartments uh, in, in the uh, 161 uh, local communities nationwide at the present time. Uh, it is estimated that the volume of food waste has declined by something like 35% after the introduction of this system. The fee for the one kilogram of food waste 
is about 10 cents on the average, which is quite cheap because there is a subsidy uh, from the local government. Uh, the guidelines for, for this system is set by the Ministry of the Environment, but the local government managed the actual operation uh, with some subsidies given uh, to, the, uh, to the users. And the second uh, policy item I'd like to mention today is the introduction of the uh, use by date label, which is quite common in many uh, other developed countries. Uh, in Korea, the, we used the, the uh, sell by date label, uh, which was introduced in 1985. Uh, under this system, sellers have to discard all food items before the sell by dates, and consumers are likely are less likely to choose the products nearing that expiration dates, which leads to the huge amount of uh, food waste. Thus, the bill was uh, introduced uh, recently uh, to implement the so-called uh, use by date label, uh, which is usually much longer than the uh, use the sell by date label. Uh, this bill was passed uh, by the Health and uh, Welfare Committee uh, in June 17th uh, this year and uh, expected to be passed by the National Assembly soon. However, uh, this bill will be implemented uh, uh, starting uh, 2023 after two year trial period in view of the fact that the public is very sensitive uh, to this issue of the food uh, for safety. So uh, this time I'd like to introduce these two items uh, which are uh, implemented uh, uh, in Korea uh, at the initiative of the uh, government, particularly the uh, Ministry of the environment. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sangma. Yeah. <clears throat> I have to say I have a huge amount of um, admiration for what South Korea has done. I, I wish that the US could have you know, little stations behind every every apartment building that we're collecting information and, and charging accordingly. I think it's an incredible solution. Um, so thank you so much. Moving on to Isla. Um, I would love to hear from you. We've heard a little bit about kind of government approaches, but of course the private sector plays such an important role in this picture. And I, I can't participate in a sustainable food conversation without Danone being right there, so committed, doing so many things. So please tell us a little bit more about what you're doing both towards um, SDG 2 and 12.3. Well, first, uh, allow me to to thank you for um, for um, being a part of uh, of this panel. It gives me yes the opportunity of speaking about Danone uh, journey in uh, food waste reduction and uh, more globally actually about the industry role in tackling this uh, very important uh, issue. Um, I think we're all believers here that uh, one actor cannot uh, solve the problem alone. Um, so um, so it's even more important. And just on a personal note, uh, for me, it's a matter uh, that's very close to my heart. So I'm, uh, I'm very happy. And um, and also leading the sales function uh, globally within Danone, um, it's um, it's something for me very relevant to be part of, of this firm, so I can share concrete actions taking place uh, in each of our markets. So just uh, first as a as an industry within the, the industry as a whole, so um, the the CGF the Consumer Goods Forum groups 400 companies that include retailers, manufacturers, and about uh, 60 CEOs. Uh, we have eight coalition within the CGF. One of them is Who's Waste, and actually I am um, have been elected the co-chair of the coalition for um, for healthy lives. So within Food Waste Coalition, we have uh, 32 uh, active members. Uh, so I heard earlier uh, members like uh, Walmart, Ahol Dolez, uh, Nestle, Unilever, and uh, of course uh, Danone. So the roadmap that we have decided, all of us as members, is first to join 12.3 in 2017, and that was actually initiated uh, at that time by uh, Dave Lewis, uh, the former CEO of, uh, of Tesco. Um, and then what we did is, uh, after obviously as we joined, is we adopted 
publicly and we committed to a goal that is about halving our food waste uh, within our operations by 2020 by 23 so 2030 uh, so so the objective is to reduce food waste in our supply chain but at the same time at the customer level um, so um, a key Part of this is how do we measure it? So make sure we are able to measure it and report these measures publicly through a harmonized approach across the whole industry. Uh, importantly is how do we act uh, to, to reduce food waste uh, in our own operations and but also uh, overall and, and our um, partnering with suppliers or customers, etc., cetera, um, just to create this coalition um, overall. And uh, and last point uh, um, is uh, how do we support the communication strategy, uh, acting as a public advocate for the consumer goods firm. Now, just concrete examples. When uh, LATAM in Argentina in 2013, we had all the CGF members uh, who run together a food waste collaboration study just to see how are we going to measure food waste? How do we how are we going to analyze the different reasons behind it? So to create the first baseline to measure progress. Um, we have, uh, especially with this COVID context, we have also focused on the most vulnerable. Uh, we talked about it a bit earlier in, in the discussion today. Uh, so during 2020, we were able to donate uh, 540 million meals uh, by uh, 51 companies across almost 100 countries. So for us, what's important in this, yes, the amount of meals being donated, of course, but also the ability and the capability to make it happen on the ground. Um, and, uh, you know, it's always a challenge to match the needs and the offer. So we leverage one of the examples in, in the U.S. is with Kroger and, uh, uh, and Google, uh, partnering the two of them with geolocalization to see how can we match between the needs and uh, the offer. And also another platform maybe in France, Solidarit platform Solidarité, which was again a collaboration between different retailers and manufacturers where we had the needs offers matching with your localization, uh, where we were able us and Danone to uh, provide one ton of yogurt. Now within Danone, now, uh, as I mentioned, for, for, for me and for Danone as a whole, collaborative approach is really key. We can't do it uh, just alone. So what we have done is we are partnering very proactively with different players from farm to fork. Uh, so it's suppliers, retailers, uh, NGOs, as, as well as consumers. So nine months ago, we joined uh, the Champions 12.3, uh, the 10, 20 by 30 initiative uh, and uh, since then to scale up really uh, the movement we have been acting as a as a catalyst for the whole uh, movement to engage our suppliers uh, to join the very good news the recent news we had is that we got the, the agreement with our three biggest uh, uh, fruit supplier uh, just recently a few few days ago so i'm very delighted we are able to engage others in that journey uh, we have also strengthened our collaboration with the global food banking network uh, so we can redistribute the food su surplus that we have. So we close together at national, regional, but also global level. Um, we are you know, trying to, to make it uh, at scale as much as possible. Uh, example I wanted to, to highlight is Ar Argentina where we made an agreement with Carrefour and uh, Banco de Alimentos uh, picks up uh, the yogurt with short expiration date. Uh, from the most important hypermarket shelves and deliver them straight away to social organizations uh, for obviously safe consumption. Um, I, I was really delighted to hear uh, Dr. Uh, Sang Mokshu uh, about uh, data uh, and date labeling, because uh, we know that 60% uh, of food waste uh, comes uh, happens at home. Uh, so one of uh, the key reasons, uh, the, say, I would say number one reasons for uh, throwing away yogurt is the uh, yogurt date. Uh, so we are moving actually from uh, um, uh, use by date to best before date, uh, wherever it's possible, and we are able to do it. Um, uh, wherever also it's continues to be safe, uh, obviously uh, for for consumers. So we have done Germany and Nordic, uh, for example. We have moved in 2021 uh, in the UK, in Belgium, in Spain. We're covering about 85% of our portfolio. So um, maybe I'll share with you this uh, the, the picture uh, of, uh, of the product, if you allow me. Uh, so to see, it's just to illustrate what I'm, I'm talking about. So you see here the example uh, in the UK and uh, in Spain with the product. So what we do is not only we 
can you see my my, my screen? Yes. Yeah. So so um so you see the here the, the um, the way we educate consumers to look, smell, taste the product and don't waste it. So it's a campaign that we are doing with the Too Good To Go um, in, in, in the UK, for instance, to reduce. Uh, and, and we know that it ha has already had a, a massive impact uh, on the waste level. Um, just um, uh, another example in the US, uh, you talked to Dana about the US, we are partnering with uh, Too Good. Uh, in the US, uh, the, our, our products. So we are uh, we have a permanent uh, program called One Cup Less Hunger. Uh, when you buy uh, two good yogurts, an equal amount of food it goes to someone in need. So this is partnering with CV Harvard in New York and uh, we don't waste in, in Denver. Um, massive, I mean, a huge amount, as you said, of examples, concrete examples that we can share, but I think every little, little matters. We're not there yet, as uh, Lisa said, uh, but we are on a journey. Dana? Thank you so much, Isla. So many things there. I know um, the Consumer Goods Forum has been a leader. I, I've been working with them here in North America and just a very genuine effort by companies to, to measure, to figure out how they can take this on. Um, and I love that date label. Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to send you a message after I need to use that in presentations. It, that's incredible. So thank you so much for all of that and, and just all the work that you're doing. Um, thank you. next we'll move to Richard. Richard, uh, we've heard from governments. We've heard from the private sector. RAP is doing so much work to bring these groups together to really, you know, be better together. So tell us about what you're doing in that arena. Well, thank you very much, Dana, and thank you very much for the opportunity to speak with you all today. Yes, RAP is running public-private partnerships around the world. We started in the UK with the Courtauld commitment, working with all the major retailers and food manufacturers to reduce food loss and waste right across the supply chain. And this agreement, through working together, has reduced edible food loss and waste by 27% from farm to fork and a 31% reduction in the home, working closely with our behaviour change campaign, Love Food, Hate Waste. This is a 1.7 million tonnes per year less food waste, worth a staggering US$6 billion US dollars per year. And now we're working with partners, including UNEP, WRI, GFN, uh, and indeed ReFed, and their members in South Africa, Mexico, Australia, and Indonesia, and the USA to adapt this approach to local circumstances and deliver significant change. So what role does redistribution of surplus food play in this delivery? How has that been delivered? And what impact has that had? So increasing redistribution is a key focus for all of these agreements. And we use a standard approach to driving change. Target, measure, and act. And target, setting clear targets for the partnership. In this case, halving food loss and waste by 2030 in line with SDG 12.3. 12 measure, establish a baseline for redistribution measure the opportunity for increasing redistribution across the supply chain, and then identify the barriers to change. And then act, using the insights from measurement, devise trials for expanding redistribution, learn lessons, and then work with retailers, manufacturers, and farmers and redistribution organizations to scale up across the industry and across the supply chain. We then monitor progress and work with businesses to adapt the approach as needed. In the UK, this methodology has delivered some impressive results. Food redistribution has tripled in the last five years from less than 30,000 tonnes per year to more than 90,000 tonnes per year. Last year, the equivalent of 220 million meals were redistributed worth 300 million US dollars. In the last year alone, during the first wave of the COVID pandemic, the amount of food redistributed has increased by nearly 50%. The growth 
was delivered by increasing redistribution across the supply chain, mainly from retail and manufacturing, but increasingly from farming and even during lockdown, the hospitality and food service sector, not least driven by the closure of that sector um, for certain parts of last year. So what has been the learning for RAP and its partners that we are sharing around the world? Firstly, it is the importance of data and measurement to find out where the biggest opportunities are, tackle them and monitor progress. Secondly, it is the, it's important to work with businesses and redistribution organizations on trialing solutions, learning lessons, and then sharing the findings with our partners to drive rapid uptake. And thirdly, it is the importance of encouraging investment. RAP provided government funded grants to expand capacity during the COVID pandemic, for example, and providing a supportive regulatory environment, um, as you heard from Emily earlier on. RAP used the findings of the trials to propose changes to regulations to government who then implemented them. The investment and regulatory change show the key importance of taking a public private partnership approach, making sure that you involve both government and business in working towards that common goal of halving food loss and waste. So in conclusion, Dana, this works. This work shows that private public partnerships can drive rapid change. The critical next step, in my view, is tailoring and using this approach wherever it's appropriate in other countries around the world. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Richard. And yes, these, these work, and that's why so many countries are, are trying to build them now. Um, and I can say um, from being part of a partnership with RAP in the US that um, it has taken a lot of work to build the platform. You know, there's a lot of upfront work to get it going. But once you kind of build that will and build that trust and start moving there, it's incredibly powerful to have these partnerships. So thank you so much for that. Um, Elijah, turning to you. So food banks have been mentioned several times throughout um, this conversation already. And while the food banking model may vary in different parts of the world, there is a common theme that food banks are a community-driven response to alleviating hunger. So what role do you see local leaders, um, such as food banks, playing in, in making progress on this issue? And how is Food for All Africa specifically um, tackling this challenge of, of food insecurity and food waste together? Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon to everyone. Yes, uh, for us at the local level, we see food banks as, as an integral part of the food system because food banks promote the transition from a linear to a secular economy, especially with the food that could have lost or wasted when it is revalued for the benefit of the economy, the planet, and people. Food banks in our part of the world serves as the center that drives stakeholders within the food supply chain together towards connecting the excesses to those incapable of affording food. In Ghana, when we started West Africa's first food bank, uh, somewhere from 2011, uh, setting up food for all Africa was very challenging because there was very little research and resources available locally to encourage the concept of food banking. All the resources available or knowledge research available back then was showing towards Europe and other parts of the world. We dig deep and the closest policy available that we saw was actually a clause in the Ghana Food and Drugs Authority Act on food donation, which basically stated when an entity is donating food, what it has to be, the condition in which it has to be, which wasn't much detailed. That posed a great challenge for us because that clause in itself alone created uh, a 
a challenge for businesses to donate food because uh, once they know there is a clause talking about the safety, they, they were discouraged. But for us, it served as an encouragement to bring stakeholders together. And in 2016, we were able to do it by organizing the first Food for All Ghana conference. I must say that from the learnings we had from that conference, uh, we were pushed to actually look at what is available in other parts of the world in order to build the right sources, the right know-how in implementing food banking in, in Ghana. And I must say, I was quite one of the few fortunate people to have met Dr. Richard Swandel way back in 2017 in London. That opportunity gave us uh, a, a big opportunity to learn more about the concept of redirecting excess food along the supply chain. We believe to achieve our shared goal of attaining the sustainable development goals, food banks need to be encouraged and supported across countries around the world, especially in developing countries. As we can see, food banking in most developing countries are still low in the numbers. The idea of food banks uh, thriving in only developed countries where there is a lot, where there is the perception that a lot of food waste is, is disputed, especially in these times of uncertainty where we are faced with COVID. Food for All Africa, through the support of partners such as GF and in this past year, has proven that know-how and ability to mobilize resources, we can really make food banking across sub-Saharan Africa worth it. Today, I'm proud to see parliamentarians in Ghana initiating smaller food banks in their constituencies. And this gives us hopes on the prospects that food banking has a shared social responsibility towards ending anger and food waste in Ghana is quite good. Thank you. Thank you so much, Elijah. Um, so many great thoughts here. So now one kind of final question that I would love for all of you to answer. Um, so here we are, uh, we have the United Nations that is at the end of this year or, or in the fall going to hold a UN food system summit. And the goal is really to build a more sustainable, equitable and resilient food system as part of that. Of course, we can't do this alone. We will need everyone to be part of it. Um, governments, civil society, private sector. So I'm curious from each of you, because you do kind of represent different sectors within this, you know, what is the role of your organization, but also the sector that you work within in achieving um, the SDGs and that goal of a more sustainable, equitable and resilient food system? Um, let's start with, uh, how about Sangmuk? Can we start <laughs> with you? <laughs> uh, okay. Change uh, the order a bit. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I'm wearing uh, several hats. And uh, one of the hats I'm wearing is I'm the president of Korea Food Bank System. Uh, and uh, I think Korea Food Bank System is uh, sort of a good example of a close cooperation between the, the, the government and the uh, private private sector. Uh, the, the food bank operation in Korea was initiated by the Korean government actually uh, in 1998 during the uh, Asian uh, financial uh, crisis. And uh, in the 2006, uh, the, the government, Korean government enacted the act on encouraging the donation of food, which uh, have uh, three things. Number one, it set the standards for food banks. And number two, it gives a uh, tax incentives for food donations. And number three, it gives a uh, budgetary support 
for administration of food banks, training of employees, and evaluation of food banks and markets. And uh, we have about 450 food banks and markets at the local district level, and they are all run by private NGOs. And uh, then we have uh, sort of uh, uh, 17 regional centers, uh, operation of which is uh, subsidized by the district, uh, regional district uh, government. And uh, my council, the Korea Council on Social Welfare, we run the, uh, the national food bank. And the, the, the budget is also uh, subsidized, uh, provided by the uh, uh, Minister of Health and Welfare. Uh, at the present time, the food bank donation amounts to something like uh, US dollar, $184 million. Uh, and the number of donors, uh, we have more than 14,000 uh, donors and uh, about more than 300,000 people uh, and also 150,000 welfare institutions uh, get free food from uh, this operation. Uh, so thus the uh, food bank uh, has become the most popular uh, sharing program uh, in Korea. And also the uh, Korea Food Bank maintains uh, quite good cooperative relationship uh, with the various government departments, such as Minister of Health and Welfare and Minister of Agriculture and so forth. And also uh, in response to the uh, COVID-19 uh, situation, the Korea Food Bank has cooperated with several uh, public institutions such as the Korea Customs Service, uh, Korea Disaster Relief Association. And uh, we expanded some of the uh, programs such as uh, Emergency Food Pack and uh, Hope Food Pack uh, for the, uh, for the uh, uh, underprivileged children uh, with a special additional food donation from private food uh, company. So I think, you know, it's a, the food bank system uh, is, a, is a one in, important instrument of uh, uh, reducing food waste. And also this can be a sort of a good uh, the, the, the mechanism where the, the public sector and private sector and the private companies, you know, NGOs, they can come together and cooperate. Yeah. That's Thank great, you. Sengmuk. Thank you. Yeah, I know here in the U.S., um, it is very, it is a charitable food system that is very separate from the government. And so, yeah, yeah. hearing about that coordination is is very optimistic and promising for me. Um, let's see, Isla. Let's move to you next. What do you think the role of the private sector is in achieving these goals broadly? Well, for sure, we have um, uh, mentioned earlier uh, this coalition that we have created uh, to to fight uh, to fight uh, food waste, and uh, we have already over thirty um, active members who have committed to half their food waste. Um, now, um, if you think about it, within the CGF, we have over four hundred companies, so it's uh, really everyday uh, work that we have to expand it to make sure it's uh, at uh, you know giving it even more scale. Um, so we have. Um, we can um, uh, completely move the needle. That's from really having our food waste, but we all know that uh, also how do we manage uh, uh, consumer, educate them, and then uh, um, manage uh, the, the food um, waste by itself afterwards. So there's a massive programs that we are putting in place. It's, uh, it's um, making it concrete uh, for, for companies and communicating the overly about it, uh, that we will be able to, to really uh, reach this joint uh, goal. I see it as a clear collaboration between all different sectors. Uh, we are uh, sometimes limited by regulation. So it's really the, the, the private sectors plus NGOs, plus governmentals, and plus uh, also um, academics who support us to really understand uh, uh, the business impact of these actions. Um, we're not NGOs who wouldn't then on, so it needs to make also business sense. And as um, for me, and that's why it's important for me being in sales that we can really do business by and profitable business by bridging 
uh, uh, this and having a positive impact on our planet. And, you know, for this, we have um, in Danone our uh, frame for uh, for action, which is uh, one planet, one health. Uh, we all live on one planet, uh, and it's so important that we give um, access to healthy uh, diets to the larger um, uh, part of our populations. So so it's really anchored in, um, in our um, DNA. But the biggest we can engage, the more we can engage with the other companies and communities and our overall ecosystem, uh, and uh, uh, the more impactful and business profitable we will be. That's great. Thank you. And I know in working with companies, I have found a lot of times um, they're very open minded if you can have a specific ask. And sometimes it's the really broad ask that can be challenging, but when you have a specific solution, you're trying to build a cooperation around that is often a successful approach um, because they know what you're asking of them and, and can you know consider it in a very concrete way as well. This is the word really, concrete actions really taking place and being it's sometimes easily implemented, really. It doesn't, but, uh, and, and that's why I was uh, keen on testifying today because just to, to show that concrete action, sometimes starting with one retailer, one manufacturer, and then we expand it and we give it the scale and, uh, and inspire others. So, uh, so the more we do it with some really concrete actions and uh, the, the most effective we will be all together. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Emily, let's move to you next. Uh, what do you think the role is of, I guess, both academia, but also just policy in general um, for, for achieving our goals here? You read my mind. I was thinking, so I want to, you know, take kind of two bites of the apple. On the policy side, I think, um, you know, I, I talked a little bit in our research. It seems like um, there's just so much opportunity there. And I want to flag two things for government. One is that what we've seen in some of these policies is that even where government doesn't have a ton of resources, there are small things that they can do in terms of breaking down barriers, whether it's, you know, looking at, um, you know, date labeling, changing the requirements there, making them more clear, doesn't take, doesn't require a lot of money. It's one of the reasons why in Refed's research, it's shown up as being really cost effective for the U.S. And, and I think it's true for other countries. The same around liability protection. It's not going to get you all the way there, but changing that and making it clear that there's protection for food donors um, doesn't cost anything to government and can break down a hurdle. Um, but I would also say, you know, I want to encourage more cross-government dialogue where this event today, lots of the work that um, all of the organizations here today are doing is trying to get at that. But I think there's a lot we can learn from one another. And then on the academic side, um, I would love to see more universities. Um, there's a lot of amazing research being done on aspects of food waste. There aren't that many kind of looking at the policy side. So we've been looking for partners. We're not gonna be able to do this work in all 190 plus countries. So I would really welcome more um, academic institutions looking at the policies in those countries. And then in the countries where we've already done research, we're really looking for um, university partners that can work with us on implementation and next steps. Um, so uh, I think there's, you know, there's a lot to do. It's been exciting. It's been a really good learning opportunity for our students too. That's great. And I will again plug the atlas that um, Emily has been working on because it just gives such a sense of the different types of policies that are out there. Um, super. Elijah, moving on to you, what do you think you know, the, the food bank sector, like what is the role in all this for, for the food yeah. bank? Yeah, uh, one key strategy that I believe food banks need to adopt has to look at addressing uh, the programs run by food banks, addressing most often social intervention programs of governments. Uh, key, take key example in, in Ghana, one, key program of Ghana government has to do with the Ghana school feeding program, which was started way back in 2007 by the Ghana government. And it's one of their key strategic uh, programs in encouraging uh, your, uh, basic education. However, the government program has always been challenged with 
the, the, the way implementation is done at the district uh, assembly level. So for us, uh, pointing home the importance of food banking, we strategize one of our key programs, which we call the Lunchbox School Feeding Initiative to be an alternative school feeding initiative that addresses the same problem that government is addressing through its school feeding. And we still work with the, the, the district assemblies to give them that alternative plan from what they implement at the government level. And as we speak, they can see clearly that uh, the way we are running as a food bank, we are operating the school feeding initiative is well worth emulating. And also discussions are already in place in them, in the government adapting some of uh, the strategies that we are using as a food bank in implementing a similar school feeding program. One other key strategy that for us at food banks need to look at is the model, the, the way we, we, we run up our model, especially in, uh, in developing countries uh, like in Sub-Saharan Africa. There is the need for food banks to appeal to uh, corporate entities because just like when uh, Ayala was saying, for the businesses to donate food to uh, food banks, it has to make a business sense to them. What do they get from it? So it's about time for young up and coming food banks within developing countries to also focus on the model they operate so that it will be more appealing to the corporate entities and other stakeholders within the food supply chain. And uh, if you look at most developing countries where food banks are, what you realize is food banks operate quite separately from other key stakeholders of the food supply chain. And there is the need for food banks to operate because food banks serve as the center that brings together the farmer, that brings together the manufacturer, that brings together the consumer, even that brings together the final beneficiary who doesn't have the means to afford food. And so by so doing, we, we will be working towards our common goal. Thank you, Elijah. Absolutely. They play such a central role. And I know, um, I know here in the U.S., especially when COVID hit, you know, I mean, the, there was such a critical role played by everyone in food redistribution. And in my town, the, the food bank actually combined, merged with the, uh, the social services agency. So now there's one organization that's addressing some of those root causes of hunger at the same time as providing food. And you know, just such a key part of that whole, the picture around poverty. So thank you. Thank you for that. Um, moving on to Richard, bring us home here, Richard. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> what do you think the role of, of, I guess, you know, the civil society organizations that are working around this or, or any other thoughts you have? Well, thanks, Dana. I, I, I think our role in civil society is to use the insights and expertise that have been gathered from the work right around the world, because there's increasing amount of work attracted onto food loss and waste reduction, um, and use that to work with businesses and governments and wider NGOs to halve food loss and waste and deliver that net zero food system that we all want. There's been a good start, you know, for example, perhaps working with around 35 countries on food and plastics around the world, but that's nowhere near enough. And the scale is just not there at the moment. And to deliver it will require, as you've heard today, a combination of policy and regulatory interventions, investment in new technology and innovation, partnerships with businesses and consumer behavior change campaigns to help citizens adopt a healthier and lower carbon diet and hopefully eliminate edible food waste. This is hugely challenging. 
and will require countries and international organizations and businesses across the world to prioritize this as you heard today that people are doing that prioritize this globally and invest and the benefits are, are really clear that's the other thing that's come across today the cost of food loss and waste as Clementine said is over a trillion dollars a year and as such the savings are huge and we know that food loss and waste feeds climate change it's responsible for eight percent of greenhouse gas emissions if food loss and waste was a country, it would be the third biggest emitter of greenhouse gas emissions behind China and the US. And yet we can do something about it. Prioritizing food loss and waste reduction will also help us tackle uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions and climate change. And as we've heard today as well, redistributing surplus food gets more to those in need. So I think the key thing going forward is us working together in partnership engaging more countries, prioritizing food loss and waste reduction, and delivering that net zero food system that we all want. And I hope the UN Food System Pre-Summit will consider this carefully when it's considering which priorities to focus on going forward. That's great. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. And, and that, that concept of sharing solutions, I think, is so important because we're all so busy trying to get our own work done. It can be hard to to keep up with what some of the successes are around the world. Um, so we have about 10 minutes for, for some questions. We have far more questions than we could possibly answer um, in that time. So I'll ask you guys to be, to be a little brief so we can get to as many as possible. Um, and Emily, we'll start with one for you that's coming in from Peru. And the question is around local policies. So you know, what, what are the opportunities around lo for local policy around the world to make a difference on this issue? Have you seen any bright um, examples or beacons on that front? I love this question. I think, um, you know, due to the limitation of like the number of countries we're including in our research, a lot of our research is focused on national level laws. Um, but well, one thing we have done is if you go into the country reports or even in some of the categories we've highlighted where even if there's not a national law, there's really exciting local laws. Um, so as one example, right now of the countries we've looked at, um, almost none of them have a national level policy that either requires a certain amount of food to be donated or has restrictions on food waste. Uh, the South Korea example is a great one. Obviously we haven't gotten there yet. Um, um, but we've seen a lot of really cool local policies um, here in the US, in Canada, in Mexico, um, in India that are doing things like this. And I think we're actually seeing the most innovative policies start at the local level. And then often when they take off and there's a lot of examples, then they move um, to become more national policies. And the other thing I'll say too, is that there's often things that can be done at the local level that can't really be done at the national level. Um, you know, waste, looking at actual like measurement of waste and restrictions on waste is often done best by local government. Um, and we heard even the South Korea example, even though it's a national law, the enforcement goes to local government, because of course, that's the most efficient way to do it. So I think we, we definitely shouldn't overlook local policies. Um, there's things I think that national governments can do to foster and um, give support to local government to be finding those innovative ways to, to do this. Great, thank you, Emily. Um, the next question is for you, Sengmuk, around the cost. So I think we're all having a little bit of envy of South Korea's system here. And um, just curious, kind of what has been the cost and the return on investment for um, the, the program around weighing, you know, the, the, the infrastructure that you need in place uh, uh, to create that program around weighing um, the food waste? You know, the uh, infrastructure investment requirement is uh, relatively high, uh, but uh, it's mostly paid by the, uh, the local government. And, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, this reducing food waste has a social <laughs> rate of return, you know. So I think it's a very good way of using taxpayers' money, okay, to reduce the... Uh, uh, the food waste, you know. Uh, so uh, if you leave it to the uh, private markets, uh, it's not going to work because uh, it's, not, it's not going to have uh, enough financial rate of return. So I think this is the area where the government has to come 
because reducing food waste has a social rate of return, you, you know. So I think, so some people argue even in Korea, <laughs> why the local government has to make a, such a such a huge investment, but I think that's a, that's a wrong question. So uh, we are really, uh, local government, is, they make, they made the decision on their own, on their own, okay? Uh, and uh, uh, I think they made that decision uh, to uh, to make an investment because that's uh, that's accepted by the majority of the residents. Residents, you know. Uh, so I think it's a good investment. There was also question about the uh, possibility of cheating, but this uh, RFID card uh, prevents all the po any possibility of cheating because uh, you have to read the card to open the bin. Then you put all the food waste. And then you read again, then it, uh, it's closed. So other people, uh, unless that, that person steals your card, uh, cannot uh, throw their waste under your name, you see? Uh, so that's, uh, and also there was another question about what is a food market? Is a food market is a sort of a small supermarket for the underprivileged people who have a sort of a qualification uh, to get free food, you know? Uh, they come in and uh, they look at things and uh, <laughs> they pick up the items uh, they want. You know, so uh, the idea is uh, to give uh, a little bit of uh, sort of a uh, visual uh, sort of a, uh, <coughs> a chance uh, to look at uh, what they want to get. You know, just like uh, you know, you 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 go to supermarket and uh, you look at the shelf and you pick up the item you want. So. That's, that's, we are, we are sort of creating uh, small supermarkets for the uh, welfare uh, recipients, you know, who are eligible to get free food. Got that. Okay, yeah. Thank you, Thank you so much. Um, next question, Elijah, is for you. Um, and it's around, although Isla, you may have something to say here too, around logistics, the logistics of donating food. Um, and just a wondering kind of, the question is one one of the barriers is logistics. So what is what are your biggest challenges? I'm sure there are many. What are your biggest challenges in the areas of, of logistics around food donation? Definitely, it has to do uh, with transportation system, which moves the food from one point, the point of access to the point of need. Then you can think about uh, storage and the right uh, to ensure that the food gets to uh, the beneficiaries in the right, under the right conditions. Uh, given uh, the point of food banking in, in most developed countries, the, the, there are the, the enabling environment that ensures that food banks have the, the right logistics in getting food to the vulnerable. However, in developing countries like us, it, it's quite a challenge. But what has been very key, and it has been quite an experience uh, personally for me, has to do with building the right network. Uh, because if, like I earlier indicated, food banks are the center that holds all other key stakeholders of the food supply chain. And so once you build the right network with all key stakeholders, be it the businesses, be it government, be it the beneficiary agencies, uh, you don't carry the, the, the challenge alone. It now becomes a challenge of all the stakeholders who see the importance of the work that you do. And I must say that uh, it's, it's been quite an amazing experience Especially, most often when you, you start as a small food bank, uh, it doesn't materialize immediately, but it's more about getting the technical know-how. And I must say that I'm fortunate that uh, Food for All Africa was able to benefit from technical know-how in our journey from different stakeholders, most importantly, uh, the Global Food Banking Network, has been very supportive in that regard. And Dr. Richard Swano since 2017 has been a go-to for me 
any time, any day, as we speak, even today, I still badge on him when I need the, the, the technical know-how, how to go about challenges that we face. So I That's believe great. network, building the right network is very critical and all other things will follow. That's super. Thank you. And I will just, um, we have maybe when one minute, Richard, our last question here is around consumer. Could you just allow me, Dana? Sorry, just sorry, to Alex, finish your question. Yes, please, <laughs> it triggered because uh, I think Elijah uh, really answered well about food waste and how do we connect uh, uh, demand and offer. I just wanted to reach uh, one point um, about food loss, uh, which is you know part more uh, upfront um, uh, on the equation. It's that one of the challenges here is to know about it. And I give you um, uh, an example when we ha were facing a uh, COVID crisis. They were obviously much um, waste in terms of foods and vegetables we're not finding uh, their the, the consumers um so, so it took us some time to to know that there was so much uh, strawberries for example not being sold uh, in, in france and almost uh, being not appropriate to, to consumption as soon as we knew that we were able to implement and develop a new variant for uh, for danone yogurt and put it in place so just meeting uh, knowing, getting, you know, having the uh, right source of information and linking it with the demand is critical. And obviously the other one in food waste is the logistical part uh, and particularly valuable for fresh products because you don't want to compromise on health or safety of the product. So once, uh, you know, perishable uh, products, it becomes even more challenging in this context. Sorry, Richard, it's you. <laughs> yeah, no, I think that's a great point. And I know... Um, having the data at the right time and being able to share that and really facilitate mm -hmm. the matching is a huge gap and one that I've, I've heard a lot of people are, are trying to work on, but it, it's just a, an enormous challenge. Um, thank you. All right. So last, last question to you, Richard, um, is around consumer education and, you know, RAP has done so much work really successful in the UK. I think the number is a 31% reduction in household waste from the work you've done there um, and are now taking that around the world. Uh, what has been, you know, if you look at all the trial and error as you have been trying to educate consumers, can you pick one or two aspects of the consumer awareness work that you think have been most effective? Yeah, if I, I'll just quickly say three things. One is when we started, uh, most people thought they didn't waste food. That was a key challenge. Nine out of 10 people in the UK thought they didn't waste food. If you don't think you don't waste food, then you can't tackle it. The second thing was being really clear on the causes of food waste in the home. You know, for example, not using leftovers, getting your portions wrong, storing things in the wrong place. All those makes a big difference. If you understand the behaviors that are leading to food waste, then, and point three, you can tackle those behaviors. You raise awareness of the issue, emphasize the benefits of acting, and then help citizens actually take targeted measures. You know, getting portions right is an easy ask. Getting your fridge temperature right is an easy ask. And actually a, a big one, using up your leftovers. We saw a massive increase um, in, in using up leftovers when we first started Love Food Hate Waste as a direct result of the communications on that. So I think those, that the summary is, clear data, understand the reasons, and then target those reasons hard with simple messages to make it as easy as possible for people to act. Super, thank you so much. All right, unfortunately, that is all we have time for today. We have so many more questions and really appreciate everyone being so engaged in the conversation and apologies, we can't get to all of them today. Um, but with that, I will pass it on to Liz Goodwin. Liz um, is, is a true champion on food loss and waste um, and leads the Champion 12.3 effort. She's also a senior fellow and director um, of the Food Loss and Waste Program at the World Resources Institute. So Liz, I will turn it over to you for some closing thoughts and just a huge thank you to all of our panelists for um, being part of this discussion today. Thank you, Dana. I mean, it has been a fascinating discussion. Um, I was writing myself some notes, but it, you know, it, we've covered so much ground and it's because we've got such a, a great uh, lineup of um, panelists and speakers. Um, we started, you know, with Lisa reminding us about the impact of COVID and the extent of food insecurity, which 
you know, it's, it's really shocking. We knew it was bad, but, you know, it, it is horrible to see a report about it. Um, and then Clementine obviously brought out the, the whole fact that, you know, household food waste is an issue globally. It's not just about a developed country problem. Um, it does affect uh, lower and middle in income families as well. And then the panel discussion was was fantastic. Um, you know, it it brought home to me, you know, just how much this there is a role for everybody of everybody to play in this. You know, the role of government, and in fact, it's not just one part of government; it's cross government. Um, and so, you know, that um, Emily brought that out really well. And then, of course, uh, Sangmok's great example about charging for food waste. I mean, you know. Um, I think I saw a, a comment in the in the Q and A at the time saying it was inspiring. Uh, it, there is some really inspiring work going on around the world, which is which is great to see. And of course, then organisations like um, Danone and Ila told us about you know the work they're doing, and it's not just within their own operations, but also working with their supply chain, which is really important because we've got to get um, much more collaboration up and down the supply chain if we're going to see um, food, food loss and waste being um, halved. And then Richard, obviously, I mean, I've worked with Richard for many years. Um, you know, I, I completely agree the importance of data, measurement, transparency of information, trying things, you know, let's not get too hit, fi stuck, fixated with trying to get a perfect solution. Let's try things and learn from them. Um, and then Elijah really brought it back to, you know, on the ground expertise and experience um, and what it's like actually um, running a food bank and, and some of their, their experiences. And then it was also superb to see so many questions. Um, and, you know, I'm sorry we didn't manage to get to all of them, but, you know, there was questions and, and people feeding off each other, which was, which was superb. As, as a couple of people have mentioned, you know, we've, this really is a timely, it's timely to have this conversation. Uh, we've got the Food Systems Summit coming up in September. Um, date still to be confirmed, um, but we've got the pre-summit coming up the 26th to 28th of July, um, and I've been co-leading the work on food loss and waste um, within uh, the, for preparation for the food summit. And we've really been, um, I think we've been in quite a fortunate position because people have been working on food loss and waste for quite a while now, but we actually do know some of the things that need to happen. So we've been working to develop a cluster of initiatives that we want member states and companies and other organizations to get behind. Um, so they range all the way through from you know, on-farm losses, um, waste and loss in the supply chain, working with businesses to help them work down their supply chains, um, trying to make sure that the right finance mechanisms are in place, trying to make sure that the food system is more circular. So what circular policies are needed um, and this is really where food banks come in because they are part of the solution of helping to ensure that food that is suitable to be eaten does get used. Um, and I think that, that's, a, that's a valuable role to play. And then there's also a, a, an initiative around um, householders and consumer food waste and how do we manage to make sure that um, householders can reduce food waste from the clearly quite shocking levels of food waste at the moment. And I think when I was reflecting on the, you know, the, uh, there are a lot of food banks um, on the call today. And when I was thinking about the role that you all have, um, you know, you are part of the solution. And, you know, we need to recognise that and you need to recognise you, you are part of the solution. And also, you know, lobby your governments to make sure they, they're taking it seriously enough and that they put it high enough up the agenda. But you're also part of your, your local communities. And so you have a role in helping um, the people in your communities know, know how to store their food and know how to use their food and make the best use of the food that they've got. So I see you having a, a double role, not just as part of a way of distributing food that um, might otherwise have gone to waste, but actually also of um, upskilling and um, building capacity within, within your communities. Within the Food System Summit, we're now in the process of building a coalition, which is all about the longer term and where we go. Um, food loss and waste is, is, is emerging as one of the st strong areas, which is fantastic. We're starting to get some real traction. So I'm hoping that we're going to have something useful to say when we get to the pre-summit in, in July. So that was my sort of um, reflections on the on the call. I, I think we, we really do need to thank all the, all the speakers again. Um, and seriously, really fantastic. Um, and thank you, Dana, for um, for moderating in, in you know, your usual um, 
professional and accomplished way, it's uh, it made the, the conversation flow very easily. Um, thank you to the Food Banking Network, um, Harvard uh, Food Law Policy um, Clinic, and to wrap um, to all of you, Lisa, Emily, and Richard, for for sponsoring it and making making the event happen. There is going to be this. This has all been recorded, so there will be a playback available later on today. Um, so if you look out for a follow up email, you should get information about how to access that. And I think with that, Mike Pop says it is exactly half past the hour. So um, thank you very much, everybody, and have a good rest of the day. <laughs>